Hello, Robs. I'm back with more grandmother stories. I'm trying to fit as much reading in before I go to work. All right. My mother's death. Oh, what a sad time it was when my mother died. And grandma's lips trembled as if the memory of it was as fresh and bitter in her mind as if it had occurred last year instead of 70 years ago. We had rented half of the house of a good Quaker family and were to stay there until the ice was out of the river. How well I remember coming in one morning with the other children and seeing mother kneading some bread. She seemed in distress. After kneading a while on the chair, she put the bread bowl in a chair and then on the table again. I saw she was in pain and I said, Mama, are you sick? And she replied, Yes, I don't feel very well. I'll need the bread for you, I said. Do you think you can do it, my child? She asked. Oh, yes, indeed I can. Then she went into the bedroom and began to undress. Father came in at that moment and he said, Why, Sally, are you sick? She answered, Yes, Eber, I am very sick. He helped her to bed and they talked a while and then he went out after a doctor and some women to help take care of her. They wouldn't let me stay in the room much, but once when they were all out, I went in and mother asked me to bring her a drink of water. I got it for her, and while I was getting it, I wiped the tears off my face so she would not know I had been crying. When I handed her the water, she looked at me long and earnestly and said, Why, my little daughter, you have been crying. What is the matter? I burst into tears then and said, Oh, mother, I'm afraid you are going to die. She replied, I hope not, my little daughter, but I never was so sick before in my life. And then she said, while looking at me mournfully, You must be a good little girl and mind your father and take good care of your little brother and sisters. Ah, said grandma, while the tears rushed into her eyes and rolled down her cheeks. I never forgot her look and her tone of voice nor what she said, and I obeyed her as long as they all lived. At night, we children went up, were sent upstairs to bed, but I could not sleep. I rolled and tossed about for a long time. Finally, I got up and dressed and went and sat on the stairs. I shall never forget what a wonderful moonlight it was and how the bright beams streamed in through the windows and how it glorified everything indoors and out and how still and solemn everything seemed. Once the door of mother's room was opened for a moment, and I slipped in, but a woman told me to go out, and I went. In the meantime, father had sent to Erie, 15 miles away, for another physician, and towards morning one came, but not the one that was sent for, for he was away. He examined mother carefully, gave her some medicine, and said the danger was over now, and she would be better soon, but that he was going to the tavern and would be back in an hour. Then the women went home, for for they all had household cares, and the good Quaker lady asked Father and us children to take breakfast with her. Father could not go, and I said I could not eat, and I did not want anything. Mother was very quiet, but soon she looked up and asked for a drink. I brought it to her, and Father took the glass to help her, but she could not swallow the water. He laid her gently back on the pillow and with two or three long drawn sighs she was gone here grandma wiped the tears from her eyes oh but she was a good mother she said said she and the lessons of neatness and industry and right doing she taught me i never forgot what i would have done without them in the trying years that followed i don't know i never went to bed after she died without seeing that the children were fast asleep and that the fire was fixed so that no accident could happen, and without making every preparation for the morning's work. I used to lie awake at night thinking of Mother, wondering if she knew how hard I tried to be a mother to the children, and to make Father happy, and to do my duty. And many a night I have cried myself to sleep, holding my youngest sister in my arms. Once in one of these vigils I thought I saw her, The moon was shining bright, and I was just as wide awake as I am at this moment. Right by the bed, leaning over me, I saw her dear face just as she looked in life, only more beautiful, gazing at me with such a yearning look of love, and yet so peaceful and contented. And she said to me, My little daughter, do not mourn for me. Be a good little girl. Take care of your little brother and sisters, and all will be well. Then she seemed to melt away. It comforted me more than I can say. 
I used to think about it a great deal, and I felt as if I had indeed seen my dear mother, and that what she said was true. Didn't she ever come again, said golden-haired Emily? Never, said Grandma. And later in life, I thought possibly I might have dreamed it, but it didn't seem so at the time. This is a curious ending to the chapter since both Eber Brock Ward and his sister Emily, the author of these words, held many seances. Eber Brock Ward actually moved the psychic, I can't recall her name at the at this time. I'll probably look it up since I have a blog on Eber Brock Ward. And he used to have daily readings with her to deal with his affairs and business. He claimed to have talked to such local luminaries as Lewis Cass. I can't remember who else, but yeah. Eber Brock Ward was obsessed with spirits and communication with them and his his will. <laughs> and he actually, one of the Fox sisters, I can't remember which one, the one who later came out and claimed it was all a hoax. He had several readings with her, and I believe when he made his will that he used it, that he used one of the Fox sisters to speak to his his deceased wife, who he had committed to an insane asylum for her guidance in the will. And she said, give all the money to your two new kids, which were Clara Ward, the future princess of Chimay and Eber Brock Ward Jr. And they basically got the lion's share of the inheritance. And he died. And the mother was basically estranged from both of those children as she continued to marry on and on. And she married off Clara to a, a faux prince in Belgium. Yeah, so... Eber Brock Ward was obsessed with getting the spirit photo in the vein of Mumler's. And I think he actually even went to see Mumler at one point. I believe that was the case, as they talked about it in the court. For his, the contesting of his will, which they had a seance at the, the, the hearings and all this stuff. It was amazing. And the fact that Eber Brock Ward is lost in the annals of history, even though he was basically the 19th century version of Henry Ford is a travesty, but that's life. All right. Goodbye.